Good evening, everybody, and uh, welcome to our latest edition of uh, Orthopaedic Specialist Updates in the Management of Shoulder and Elbow Arthritis. Um, it gives me great pleasure to introduce my friends and colleagues um, on the panel today. So we have Mr. Ali Nurani, uh, Professor Roger Van Reet, Mr. Jagwan Singh, uh, Ms. Val Jones, and uh, myself. So we're going to be going through the topic of shoulder and elbow arthritis. So as, as a lot of you will know, the orthopedic specialist team is, is, a, is a large team of um, hand-selected uh, orthopedic surgeons and allied healthcare professionals who uh, look after all elements of orthopedic specialties, uh, ranging from upper limb, spine, lower limb, uh, maxillofacial surgery and pain medicine. Um, we've recently also uh, appointed um, a physician, a rheumatologist. So we're lucky to have a really big team. We're based out of Harley Street Specialist Hospital. This is our um, place on Queen Anne Street. It's a day case hospital. Um, it's a triple fronted building uh, over four, four floors. Uh, seem to have two theaters uh, where we host all our outpatient um, uh, clinics and outpatient procedures. And then we do our bigger surgeries at the London Clinic. Um, so for all the sort of major procedures that we do, uh, the London Clinic um, looks after our patients there. And many thanks to them today for, um, for uh, helping to put this together. Uh, we also have thanks to um, the BMI and the Nuffield uh, who are welcoming as part of the team too. So uh, Mr. Ali Nurani requires no um, introduction. He's very well known amongst um, all people related to upper limb management of upper limb pathology. Um, he's one of the co-founders of Orthopaedic Specialists and the Harley Street Specialist Hospital. And as many of you will know, he's a leading upper limb surgeon in uh, Bart's of London, which is a Europe's largest trauma center. He's got a, um, a practice based in, in central London for um, both privately and NHS. And he's internationally recognized for all his work related to upper limb uh, pathology. Val Jones is uh, also part of the team and she's a highly experienced physiotherapist with specialist interest um, in the topics we're discussing today, upper limb uh, pathology. She's the representative for the British and Elbow uh, Shoulder Society, as well as the European Society for Elbow and Shoulder Rehabilitation. Um, she's very well known for her work and lectures internationally and is published um, in Upper Limb Pathology. Uh, Professor Roger Van Riet, um, he's also part of our team. He's based out in Belgium and as, uh, as well as the Harley Street Specialist Hospital. And he truly is a pioneer in arthroscopic surgery um, in, around the elbow. It, he's well known for treating international athletes, including Olympic and world champions. And a lot of the techniques that he will be talking about are techniques that he's developed uh, and pioneered himself. If you look him up in PubMed, he's got, got over 100 peer reviewed papers, and he was the first president of the Belgian Shoulder and Elbow Society. Mr. Jagwan Singh, um, he's uh, um, part of the team, and he's uh, also a very experienced trauma and upper limb surgeon. Uh, he has a real passion for joint preservation techniques and he's he's very well trained in um in the fellowships that he's done with at the stedman clinic the harvard shoulder unit and the mayo clinic and these are all fellowships that he's done traveling around the us um, he's been awarded the prestigious charlie gold medal and it's also widely published in upper limb um, pathology i myself i'm a lower limb surgeon and i work with um, the team that i've introduced and it's, my, it's a real honor for me to be uh, part of the team. And um, I, I normally host the uh, webinars that you will, you will have been attending in the past. And just to let you know, um, we're gonna be hosting our next webinar on the 25th of November. Uh, Professor Philip Schottel uh, will be presenting from uh, Germany and he's a, a real authority in the management of patellofemoral disorders. For those of you who are interested in learning a bit more about these disorders, um, I, I highly recommend this talk um, and you can register in the same way, following us on our channels on LinkedIn and Twitter. And these are all our Twitter handles. Um, if you wish to uh, um, ever come and see us in action, either at Harley Street Specialist Hospital, London Clinic, the Nuffield or uh, the London Independent Hospital, uh, please get in touch uh, via the contact details below. Uh, we frequently host um, people to come and see us do either procedures or sit in on clinics, uh, so we'd be most welcome to do that. Just some housekeeping rules. We'll be answering questions as we go along. 
um, but there will be an opportunity to ask questions also at the end of each talk. Um, and Mr. Ali Narani will be um, moderating that. So without further ado, I'm gonna hand over to Ali um, to, um, uh, to take over. So Ali's gonna, I'll stop sharing my screen. Our first speaker is gonna be Mr. Jagwan Singh. So I'll, I'll hand over to him. Um, Jag, all, all yours. Yeah. Thank you, Jag. Um... Well, well, Jag, while you're putting on your slides, I'll just do a quick little um, plan for today. Um, so uh, Rags, uh, thank you for the uh, kind introduction. Um, so uh, Jag Singh is gonna be talking about managing shoulder arthritis. Um, and following that, um, we're gonna have uh, Roja speak about elbow arthritis. Um, and in between uh, those uh, talks, uh, there'll be a minute or two that we can put up, that people are putting up their slides. Um, we're gonna answer some question and answers. And then the, uh, the best talk of the evening is going to be Val Jones talking about rehabilitation of uh, both the elbow and shoulder arthritis. So uh, it's, a, it's a pretty uh, busy session. We're going to hopefully wrap it up in about one hour. But please feel free to answer as many questions as you have. I am moderating, looking through all the questions. Some of the easy ones I'll answer directly, but the others one I'll be posing to the panel. So uh, we want to make this as interactive as possible. So without further ado, Jack is... Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Ali. Um, so yeah, good evening, everyone. Uh, I am one of the surgeons with the orthopedic specialist uh, dealing with shoulder and elbow. My NHS practice is at Lewisham and Greenwich Trust. So, can't, oh, okay, from here. Um, I did my training at uh, Bart's Health and Royal National Orthopedic Hospital, did my fellowships at Wrightington and Nottingham, and as part of my British Shoulder Elbow Society traveling fellowship, I had the pleasure to go and visit multiple centers in the US, where I learned a lot from pioneers, uh, pioneering surgeons. We'll be, I'll be talking about the shoulder arthritis this evening and how there are recent developments and also how technology is just transforming the, um, the world of shoulder arthroplasty and helping surgeons to, uh, to improve their skills and get uh, uh, better outcomes for the patients. Uh, if we look at the problem of the shoulder arthritis, its prevalence is around four, uh, shoulder problems, the prevalence is 14%. One to 2% of adult uh, referrals to the GPs are about new onset pain and two to 5% of this group is uh, exclusively shoulder arthritis. It has a huge socioeconomic impact. When we talk about shoulder arthritis, it could be osteoarthritis, rheumatoid arthritis, and what we see in the young people, post-traumatic instability arthropathy, arthritis which developed as a result of um, stabilization surgery, post-surgery, and avascular necrosis. Uh, just a typical Osteoarthritic shoulder patient would be somebody in the 60s or 70s coming with pain, stiffness, limitation of movement, night pain, pain inhibiting um, power and weakness. Most of these patients are managed with analgesia injections in the community. Um, while we examine them, it's important to examine about rotator cuff, whether the patients would have stiffness and it'll be both active and passive loss of movement pseudoparalysis and um, quite a lot of my GP friends always ask me, oh, what is, how do you differentiate this from frozen shoulder? And my answer for that would be an x-ray would tell us about arthritis, the arthritic picture clearly evident on AP and the axillary view. When we have an intact rotator cuff, the humeral head is centered and the kind of arthritis we see is loss of joint space and the bony spur, which is known as goat's bear. And this picture is different from when you have a torn rotator cuff, the humeral head shifts superiorly and it just creates a different wear pattern on the, on the socket, that's the glenoid. So a centered humeral head, which is osteoarthritis, has a different um, arthritic pattern to a torn rotator cuff where there is superior migration of cuff tear. And that's why we have different treatments for this. For an a, for a, a intact rotator cuff, we have an anatomic shoulder replacement, which replaces the socket with a socket and ball with a ball. Whereas we have a torn rotator cuff, cuff tear arthropathy, we do a reverse shoulder replacement where 
we have a glenosphere on the socket side, as we can see in these x-rays. Now, coming on to the treatment options, um, arthritis of the shoulder is, you know, the start of the management is activity modification, physical therapy. My colleague Van Jones is going to talk about that. Then painkillers start for non-steroidal cortisone injection, then visco supplementation with hyaluronic acid, PRP, stem cells. There is a lot of evidence coming out right now. And uh, there is evidence that in earlier, younger patient, they do have a role to play. We can spend the whole evening on, on, on the evidence behind them, but I'll move on to the operative management of, um, of arthritis. We have arthroscopic management, and then we have the joint replacement. So to start with, uh, Peter Millett uh, pioneered the concept of uh, comprehensive arthroscopic management of uh, arthritis of the shoulder, wherein it mean it involves combination of surgical procedures to treat pain generators inside the shoulder. This is quite effective for young patients. Uh, I have to acknowledge uh, the slides uh, and the video from Ali, and we see here an arthroscopic keyhole surgery inside the shoulder. It's quite worn out, a lot of cartilage changes, a lot of degenerative changes, and uh, this procedure involves shaving and taking out any chondral flaps. We shave the osteophytes, as you can see uh, in the other picture. Um, it, this procedure also involves um, releases. Uh, we do um, uh, interval release. We do a release um, in the subacromial space. Uh, if the biceps is pathological, we'll do a tenotomy of the biceps and tenodes it. It also involves doing a subacromial decompression and AC joint uh, excision if the AC joint is painful. So how effective is this procedure? Um, well, greatly effective, nearly 85% at two years. So if we see uh, Peter Millard's case series, 26% of the patients required shoulder arthroplasty at two years. That means 75%, three fourths of the patients are managing and getting effective, um, uh, effective kind of symptomatic relief. And this is important for these young patients who do not want to have shoulder replacement. Uh, also, what we saw in this series that less than two millimeter joint space had high failure rate. So if the arthritis has not progressed too much and the patient is young, this is a good option to delay uh, shoulder arthroplasty. Now, when we look at the shoulder arthroplasty, we've talked about reverse anatomic. We also have options of hemiarthroplasty and resurfacing. In the recent times, we've gone away from hemiarthroplasty and, recent, and, and resurfacing for the right reasons. When we look at the survival rate, 92% with the total shoulder and 72% with the hemiarthroplasty. Comparison of the pain, much, much better than a total shoulder replacement. And the biggest problem we had with the hemiarthroplasty and the resurfacing what, was that they were eroding the glenoid and they were making the later procedures far more difficult by causing kind of a severe glenoid erosion. Anatomic shoulder replacement, a durable and predictable outcome, you know, 85% uh, survival at 20 years, 97% at 10 years for, for even younger group than 50 years old, and 84% as 15 years. So by far the, the best outcome, best in terms of outcome and function, for patients, even younger patients, I would say. Now, in the recent time, there has been lots of advances in shoulder hardware, the humerus, the glenoid, but software technology has come and it has made huge uh, additions and huge kind of impact to the techniques and about pre-operative planning. The conventional stem has seen transformation from the, the usual stem to a stem, uh, short stem, which is metaphysical bearing, to stemless now. So the stemless um, offers us um, easy revision. It loads the proximal uh, humeral bone. The problem with the long stem was that it was distally loading and the um, proximal bone was resorption, but the uh, stemless gives us the option to, to keep the proximal bone loaded and intact. And also at the same time, there is evidence coming that it decreases blood loss, uh, reduced time and reduced infection rate. Um, the first series, 149 patients, only three needed revision and there was no migration subsidence or osteolysis. 
this is what I talked about stress shielding. In a metaphyseal bearing stem, you are loading the proximal bone. Whereas if you see in these long stems, the proximal bone is resorbing and it creates bone loss, which is not good for the implant and also for further surgeries. Now, when we talk about the glenoid, that is the most challenging part of shoulder arthroplasty or shoulder replacement, especially the glenoids when they start to wear unevenly, it becomes very difficult to correct the deformity, both in primary and revision shoulder surgery. Here we see this B2 type of a glenoid where there is irregular wearing out, the posterior wearing out, and also subluxation of the humeral head. If you've been doing something like this in your younger days, you have more chance of getting this B2 type of a glenoid, which is, um, kind of a biconcave glenoid. And if we do not kind of um, correct this deformity, the problem we have is early failure. You have uh, a glenoid on an uneven surface. It gives a rocking horse phenomenon. And that was the reason why these glenoids were failing earlier on and causing problem. Now, people would say that we can ream the even surface, but if we start to ream that much of surface beyond 15 degrees, it will cause bone loss to the glenoid where there isn't much bone. It will cause perforation, medialization, and we will never be able to get our rotator cuff tension intact. Again, a reason why anatomic shoulders were failing in this group of patients. Um, we can talk about restoring the glenoid bone with more metal or more bone. But again, the failure rates are quite high in, in, in these groups. Uh, yes, reverse shoulder replacement is an option, but these are young patients and the function is not as great with a reverse as with a total shoulder replacement. We at Wrightington have used augmented posterior glenoids uh, to correct this. So it's just using a, um, a stepped wedge glenoid to fill the defect. And um, for anatomics and for reverse shoulders also, the recently we've got augment glenoids, which have been used for the past few years. Um, if, you, if you want to use the bone, that is the bone implant composite. So bone is taken from the patient or we can use a cadaveric bone and fill, use it to fill the defect. Now, why do we need to do all this? Why can't we put the glenoid on? Um, on the media, uh, on the on the uh, on where the medial uh, glenos uh, glenoid surface is, the problem is lateralization. We know um, the problem is notching. Sorry, because if if the implant is medialized, it will notch and it will cause early failure, as we can see here. So that is the concept of scapular notching, and to avoid that, we have to lateralize. Also, at the same time, the lateralization um, gives us another. Um, uh, kind of stability to the implant. It gives us what is known as a deltoid wrapping, which is makes the deltoid as a compressive force. And um, also at the same time, the more lateralization gives a proper contour to the shoulder. Uh, it'll be interesting to know Val's comments later on because we see patients who, which, who come and they say, oh, why my shoulder is flat on one side? But the more lateralization restores the normal contour of the shoulder, it stabilizes the implant and it avoids notching, which it was a big problem when we, uh, when we talked about reverses on, especially on a slightly medialized uh, glenosphere. Precise positioning of a base plate is very important in an anatomic because it restores the cuff tension. And if we are not able to have proper cuff tension, um, it leads to overstuffing or high neck cut or a proud stem. These will all lead to an early implant failure. Uh, with an augmented glenoid, we published our results and, um, and, and 10, 11 out of 10 patients had nearly five millimeter um, centering of the humeral head. So very good results we've achieved with, uh, with, with um, augmented glenoids uh, and they've corrected glenoid retroversion, corrected, the, eliminated the posterior instability using the wedge glenoids. Um, not revision, but these are early uh, results, two year results now, as we can see here. So a B2 glenoid with um, subluxation of the humeral head, nicely restored with, a, with, a, with an augmented glenoid. Um, again, um, quite, a, quite a severe subluxation and a B2 glenoid, nicely restored with, the, with, the, uh, with, the, with an augmented glenoid in this anatomic replacement. This is one of my reverses. We've used a 
augmented glenoid hair, uh, again, to build up and have lateralization to prevent notching. Uh, the results of these will be published in, in later this year. Uh, now, talking about bone grafts in glenoid, the always um, our concern was that how are the bone grafts going to behave in the long term? That is, will they have subsidence? Will they have resorption? Will they fail? Um, and there were multiple series uh, which, which kind of were, have proposed that we should be looking into long term results with these bone grafts. Um, for as far as bone grafts are concerned, we can take the bone graft from the humeral head when we are doing the operation as the technique of bioRSA, which was uh, uh, kind of described by Pascal Beaulieu and his group. So you, you put the glenoid base plate on the humeral head and you take away all the bone around it and put it on the, on the glenoid. And this restores the, uh, the, the glenoid defect. Uh, if it's the revision case, we can take this bone from, um, from iliac crest. And what we see here is an implant bone composite ready to be implanted into the native glenoid. Uh, we've looked into the results of these to find out how much is the peg integrating and how much bone graft has incorporated. Uh, 41 patients, 43 shoulders, and out of these 43, 42 have shown kind of more than 50% PAG integration and complete incorporation. We also looked at volume changes in the bone graft and uh, there wasn't any significant volume change over a two year period or more than two year period. And this was done with the CT scans, very good function, constant scores, Oxford scores and American shoulder elbow scores. Um, as far as complications, we had cuff failure and that was only seen in the anatomic. But with regards to the bone graft, that has really uh, integrated well. You can see from these examples, these are all three to four years follow up and nice bone graft um, integrating with the native glenoid. Um, and again, in this, um, the rotator cuff doesn't seem to be working well, but the bone graft has integrated into the native glenoid. Uh, we conclude that bone grafts um, are really a good option uh, to, to um, to take care of the bony defects. And with the trabecular metal, it, they provide a very good reliable method of addressing the glenoid bone defect. Uh, this study is just in print with the Journal of Shoulder and Elbow Surgery and will be published next month. Um, now we come on to the virtual pre-op planning. Uh, technology now has advanced and there are it is unparalleled kind of the options we have. We can have predictable and reliable 3D measurements, which can give us an accuracy about the 3D pathology um, and then play a role in implant selection, patient specific uh, instrumentation. As I said, especially for, a, for, a, for an anatomic shoulder, the placement of the glenoid um, is vital to avoid any, um, any problems. And, um, and this is an example of, um, my own patient looking at 3D, 2D computer uh, CT scan images converted into a 3D, looking at the defect, looking at what implant would be uh, suitable for it. So it's a augmented base plate, sitting ratio 99%. Um, and um, if we need, we can generate a guide. So the guide will allow the surgeon to navigate when he's operating. And this all leads to best, better patient outcome, implant longevity, um, things have gone a step further with these holographic glasses. You can take your 3D planning to your um, operating uh, site. So you're just 3D uh, plan with the 3D pathology. Earlier on, we used to uh, kind of correlate, try to correlate the 3D pathology with the 2D CT scan. But now you can have your pre-op plan with you in the theater, see it. And this merging of software, implant designing, artificial intelligence, uh, which will help surgeons to plan and augmented reality has really transformed the world of um, shoulder surgery. And definitely in the years to come, this will take it to a different level. Uh, as you can see over here, um, you know, cutting the humerus, attending the glenoid, you have a 3D plan in front of you and that is gonna guide the surgeon. And that's the concept of uh, mixed reality uh, using artificial intelligence, using um, augmented reality. Uh, and this is all coming, it's all in now. Um, and, and that's the future, better planning, better performance, better patient outcome. 
Um, I would like to tell everyone, you know, 100 years ago in 1917, um, it was Ernest Emery Codman from the Massachusetts General Hospital who gave us the idea of end result, you know, patient outcome. At that time, he was not, this was not appreciated by his colleagues, but 100 years later, we in UK talking about get it right the first time, and we are focusing so much on giving our patients the best choice, uh, the best implant, the, the better surgeon uh, performance, uh, just making the learning curve better with, for the surgeons with all the augmented reality and uh, artificial intelligence. So, so the future uh, is going to, just next few years are going to see a huge transformation in the, in the shoulder arthroplasty. And that is me. Uh, thank you very much. Um, any questions? Jags, that was a nice talk uh, to cover pretty much everything in uh, shoulder arthroplasty um, in, in less than 20 minutes. Uh, if you can stop sharing um, so Roger can um, um, then share his screen, that'd be fantastic. So one of the things is that, um, uh, Jags, the, some of the questions from the panelists, uh, from, the, from the audience is about uh, the new tech, right? So one thing to add, of course, is that you know, we know that virtual uh, reality plus robotic surgery, et cetera, has a huge role to play yeah. um, in arthroplasty general. But I feel that it has probably has a much bigger role to play um, um, in the shoulder surgery because, you know, the shoulder glenoid, unlike knees and so on, can vary so much. And you only see a little bit. And then you have this big scapula, thin scapula behind it. So getting the trajectories for screws and so on can be, quite tricky. Um, so I think there are going to be some really, really uh, interesting advances in um, um, at least shoulder surgery when it comes to arthroplasty. And, and we are relying more and more on doing the um, shoulder um, anatomic replacements because of the great function. And this technology is kind of pushing the boundaries where earlier on people would just think about, oh, I'll do a reverse. Now they are thinking about an anatomic shoulder because you are able to augment the glenoid with the options available. So just a quick question before, um, 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 you know, Roger starts. Roger, you are probably seeing less elbow arthroplasty than you used to 10 years ago, 15 years ago. Well, no, it's more or less the same. We uh, we never we never had a big uh, rheumatoid practice, so. Uh, oh, I see. Fantastic. So in England, the room because of the rheumatoid uh, medication and so on, the elbow arthroplasty numbers have uh, drastically fallen. The shoulders kind of remain the same because a lot of it was osteoarthritis and cuff arthropathy, but the elbows have dramatically fallen. I used to do one a week as a trainee, but we do very little here. Um, so can I ask you, Roger, before you start, how many elbow um, replacements do, would you do in a normal year, I mean, not a COVID year, basically? Normally about 35. Yeah, so you know, that is probably more than every single person in London combined, huh? So that's quite interesting. So anyway, so I'll, well, I'll ask you some, your, your experience on elbows as well after your talk. Uh, but uh, without further ado, Roger, can we have, uh, looking forward to your talk. Thank you. So um, I was asked to talk about uh, elbow arthritis and I do have a disclosure, I'm a consultant with Acumed um, and I'm a designer of uh, the uh, XO Elbow Splint by Jake Design. So as you know, arthritis uh, definitely has some genetic factors. Uh, they, they involve, uh, in they're involved in osteoarthritis as well as inflammatory diseases, uh, maybe hemophilia. Besides the genetic factors, obviously loading plays a big role and, and in most uh, patients, it will be professional loading like this guy. If you're pouring concrete all day, even if you don't, if you're not uh, genetically predisposed, you you will still end up with elbow arthritis, obviously. However, if you're genetically predisposed and have this profession, you might then not end up with elbow arthritis. You might still be fine, even though even though your parents and grandparents all had it. Sports play an important role, and um, Ali already alluded to this that. Um, we used to see more rheumatoid arthritis patients or most uh, surgeons used to see more rheumatoid arthritis patients. We see a lot of uh, patients with, uh, with traumatic injuries that uh, develop arthritis later on. And sports is a big one. And this is one of the Belgians' uh, best uh, judoka. She's retired now, but uh, just after the London Olympics, she came to me with this elbow, with big osteophytes on the humerus. Um, there's a, um, a big osteophyte on the coronoid. 
And in fact, she said she missed the medal because when she was squeezing the neck of her opponent, uh, it didn't it hurt too much. So she probably fractured that little osteophyte on her coronoid there um, when she was flexing her elbow. <clears throat> well, this is easily removed and um, it decreases the pain substantially. Obviously, doesn't do anything to the cartilage damage that's already there as well. So David Stanley's group looked at the demographics of osteoarthritis and found a prevalence of about 2%, uh, mainly in uh, older people, obviously more than 40 years old. Uh, that's debatable, obviously, the, the age. Male-female ratio is about 4 to 1. This is a Belgian handball player, and he um, falls, dislocates his elbow, and he has a simple elbow dislocation. And for those of you who are familiar with that, it means that you reduce the elbow and the x-ray looks normal or virtually normal. You don't see any, any fractures. That, that's... Uh, what's called a, a simple elbow dislocation. Well, um, we used to think that was quite benign, and uh, we still think that the results of conservative treatment obviously are, are very good. So most of these patients will not, have will not have surgery. However, every once in a while we have a patient where we do do surgery, and we've started doing this arthroscopically, and then we've been seeing persistently seeing cases like this. So this is a patient with a simple elbow dislocation, and you see a huge cartilage damage, a big gap on the, uh, on the back of the capitellum and a big gap on the back of the trochlea. So this is from the back of the elbow. Normally, you're not supposed to go in with your camera between uh, uh, the humerus and the ulna, or you're not, you simply can't because that's a closed uh, a compartment. However, in this case, I could move my camera from medial to lateral, from lateral to medial. At this point, the elbow is reduced, and then we fix the um, LCL uh, arthroscopically, but that's uh, another talk, I guess. This is relatively common. This is a... Uh, 80 something year old patient who had a distal humerus fractures, fracture, it was fixed. And um, as you can see, the hardware has been removed. And a few years later, she came to us with uh, a lot of pain. And, and this is what we mostly see in patients, it's pain. That's why they, uh, they consult us, not necessarily the range of motion, uh, depending how, uh, on the age of the patient, obviously, but in this case, elderly patients, they come for pain. This is a more difficult one. This is a post-traumatic arthritis, 45 year old patient, and he's completely ankylosed. From a, uh, from a fracture that he sustained as a child. So symptoms of osteoarthritis include pain, uh, decreased range of motion, impingement type pain like, uh, like the judoka. So if there's an osteophyte and they're, they, uh, they make contact, then that's usually very painful. It can be locking. It's very important to ask the patients if there is locking because locking is not good. It might, um, it might be caused by loose bodies, and loose bodies, per definition, almost, um, they will damage cartilage. And cartilage is something that we really do not know how to treat yet. There's, there can be swelling, and there might be hyperesthesia or paresthesia, especially in the ulnar nerve region, in the, in the little finger and half of the ring finger. We start with plain radiographs, obviously. And on the plain radiographs, you already see quite a bit. Uh, on the left, you'll see the decreased space between the radius and the capitellum. So that's a, a decrease of cartilage. And you obviously see that big loose body at the front of the elbow. However, if you do a CT scan, you notice that we have more than one loose body. So if we are contemplating surgery, we will always do a CT scan because we don't want to go in, take out that big chunk of bone, and then maybe leave other pieces that might uh, cause the elbow to block or might cause the elbow to degenerate even faster. We get 3D reconstructions uh, following the CT scans, but this is not necessarily for me. I prefer to have uh, the plane uh, CT images, and then I'll kind of reconstruct them in my head. Um, however, this is a very important tool to, uh, to show the patients and to, uh, to tell them, listen, this is what's going on in your elbow. This is what's uh, causing your problems, and this is what's causing your pain and blocking. Again, David Stanley groups showed uh, on radiographic views, there was a thickening of the electron foster membrane, which is over here. Um, you can debate whether it's actually the membrane that's thickened or whether this, these are just osteophytes that have been uh, built up over there, but it, it's very common to find this. Yao Wai Lim looked at um, uh, CT scans and he, he found that osteoarthritis starts at the radiohumeral joint, whereas osteophytes can mainly be found at the onhumeral joint. So these are two different types of arthritis that, that can coexist in, uh, in the elbow with radiohumeral degeneration of the cartilage and onhumeral osteophyte formation. Treatment, obviously, we start non-operatively, uh, and surgery is an option in, the, in many patients, especially when there's blocking or locking of this joint. 
this is a difficult one to explain to the patient, but it's extremely important. You know, you, if you can change your lifestyle, maybe even change your job or change your hobby, maybe you can avoid uh, progression of your degeneration or at least postpone your degeneration. I'm not completely sure about the salad, but all the other things I think is good advice. Physiotherapy, and I'm so happy Val is here because she's the, the world expert in physiotherapy on the elbow, and she'll talk about what she does. In my mind, I think the physiotherapist uh, provides pain relief, uh, provides uh, or maintains range of motion unless there's a big uh, mechanical issue like those osteophytes. Obviously, the, even valve can't fix them um, or lose bodies and then maintain or improve function. Th those in my head are the main uh, reasons to send people to physio. Many patients will take medication, pain relief, um, non steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, even for a longer time. I tend to tell them, listen, if you have a, a um, uh, stomach uh, ulcer that's worse than a, than a painful elbow so be very careful with long-term non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs in, in my opinion at least. Glucosamine or chondroitin uh, there's been a positive uh, effect on synovial fluid in osteoarthritis that's been shown in knee uh, literature there's no evidence in the elbow but obviously that's because uh, probably because the elbow arthritis is so rare. Injections Cortisone, every once in a while, maybe if you want to decrease inflammation caused by, uh, uh, by the arthritis, but obviously it doesn't do anything uh, to the arthritis. You can use um, hyaluronic acid, PRPs or lipogems, and they might uh, change the cause of the disease. But unfortunately, at the moment, um, we can only decrease the progression of the disease and not, we can't turn back time. Then surgery, um, like I said, if there are conflicting osteophytes, if there are loose bodies, I think surgery may even be the first option to talk about, and it can be open or arthroscopic. Interposition arthroplasty is a little bit too far uh, for this uh, presentation, and then I'll talk about total alcohol replacement as well. So this is a patient where we did an open debridement. We did that because, because of the cartilage, uh, sorry, because of the calcifications on the medial side of the elbow. So the ulnar nerve in, in this case was uh, I was injured as well because of that, uh, because of those osteophytes. So we needed to remove them. And uh, that's pretty scary to do this arthroscopically. So I prefer in this case, uh, clear post-traumatic arthritis with ossifications on the medial side. I prefer to do this open. You saw the range of motion. Many patients are very stiff, not necessarily always a, a mechanical problem with uh, the bone, at least not, not always a bony problem. It can be cartilage, uh, sorry, it can be cartilage and can be capsule as well. So on the medial side, we do an anterior transposition when patients have such um, uh, decreased range of motion because um, if you give them range of motion, you might end up with a, uh, with a stretched ulnar nerve anyway if you don't do anything about the nerve. So at least do a uh, ulnar nerve release if there's less than 90 degrees arc. Uh, and in the cases where there's a very hostile bed, like in this case, we prefer to do an ulnar nerve transposition. Although that's relatively rare, but, uh, but especially when the, when the bed is compromised, we feel it's safer to uh, transpose the nerve. This is a lateral column procedure. Um, you see that the LCL remains intact. We uh, split the extensor tendons. Uh, we release the entire capture from the bone and then um, very often we'll remove a bit or the entire part of, uh, of the uh, pathological capsule. You have to be careful, of course, because of the nerve that's at the front, but this is a relatively straightforward procedure with, uh, with uh, pretty good results. Arthroscopy, um, this is what I prefer and what we'll, uh, we'll probably do most uh, of the time, unless there's a clear reason to do this open. Um, this is an arthroscopic view of the elbow. At the top, you see the humerus. At the bottom, at the moment, we're looking at the, cor the coronoid um, and the radial head is at the far left. This is the same view, but then an arthritic elbow, um, almost no cartilage, radial capitella joint, small loose body there in the synovia. Um, there's um, a secondary uh, instability, as you can see. You can just look inside the joint there where at the coronary process and you'll see the osteophytes at the top of the humerus. And despite the fact that this elbow looks really bad, the results of arthroscopic debridement are really good, but temporarily, of course, because we're not doing anything about this uh, cartilage lesion. This is a case of anterior impingement. You'll see the, the coronary process coming into view and it's hitting the osteophytes at the humerus, at the top of the humerus. That's not only painful, but it'll decrease range of motion as well. 
This is a burr, and with that burr, we'll take off the ossified of the humerus and we'll recreate a new fossa at the front of the elbow. And as you can see, um, the elbow doesn't impinge anymore. Another thing you can do, and usually they're combined, is you can remove the coronoid osteophyte. So we just simply remove the tip of the coronoid. That doesn't do anything to the stability of the elbow. It doesn't decrease the stability. And it's relatively straightforward to do it this way with a the, with the small five millimeter osteotome. It looks huge, and the first time you do it, it's quite scary, but it's actually much easier than to do this with the burr because um, uh, be, you know, at the back of this osteophyte, there is cartilage, there is humeral cartilage, and you don't want to hit this. I didn't edit this, uh, this part of the video. That's to show you how easy and how fast this is to just remove that osteophyte, and that, um, that basically cures the impingement. Loose bodies, they're fun, or they can be fun, they can be very frustrating as well, uh, because they, uh, they tend to be quite slippery. Um, obviously, I took a video where they, this one just fell into my clamp, but sometimes you have to really go and chase them, especially at the front of the elbow, where there's lots of little places to hide. This patient is a little bit further in his, uh, his or her uh, degenerative process, big osteophyte, uh, lots of uh, synovitis, lots of fibrosis, in the joint, which makes it much more difficult to do this arthroscopy and more dangerous as well. As you know, the radial nerve is at the front and we definitely do not want to hit this radial nerve. So we'll start by uh, removing that loose body that you saw initially. And basically we do the same. It, it doesn't really matter how bad the elbow is. You just follow the same steps all the time. So get into the room, create a room with a view. And then once you have the view, you start working in that room. This is the back of the elbow, um, not a, a very bad elbow. That's the, um, I'm just pushing on the ulnar nerve of my thumb there. And this is the olecranon, uh, and there's the olecranon fossa at the top. And then when you continue to the lateral side, you fall into this, um, uh, into this room where there's the radial head. And on the left, you'll see the uh, ulnar humeral joint. If you're lost, so for surgeons who are planning to do elbow arthroscopy and, and, and feel a bit lost or feel a bit scared, if you're lost, always rotate the forearm. If you see a bone rotating, that's the radial head. The ulna will not rotate. So make sure that, you sit, that you're seeing what you're doing before you start using instruments. Loose bodies at the back, um, pretty straightforward. This is in the olecranon fossa, however, um, especially when you're starting, it's very easy to miss loose bodies. That's why we need a CT scan because it's quite easy to remove those two. But if you forget about these two on the medial side, this is in medial gutter, and I'm just squeezing them out of the uh, out of the ulnar humeral, uh, sorry, out, out of the ulnar gutter. Well, if you forget about these two, the results will be very poor. And you might feel happy about your surgery that you removed a few loose bodies, but unless you remove all of them, the results will be poor. Posterior impingement, exactly the same as anterior impingement, but more common because as you know, the biceps and the brachialis are at the front of the elbow and uh, in flexion, it's quite uncommon for the bones to hit each other. In extension, it's very common for the bones to hit each other. And these are removed exactly the same way as at the front with a little, uh, with a little osteotome and you're just creating a new uh, tip of the olecranon. This is a Swedish tennis player. He's at the um, U.S. Open. You saw the, the, clean, the sorry, the, the changing rooms here. It's open, not very glamorous. Um, his elbow was blocked and locked. Um, in fact, he had problems uh, six months before, and we, uh, I told him he needed surgery. He didn't do it at the time because it unlocked again, but it kept on coming back. And he, even though he's, I think he's in his early early twenties, he developed osteophytes because of that uh, that blocking and continuous inflammation. There's his two loose bodies at the back of the joint. And uh, again, because of that blocking, you get a bony reaction, huge osteophyte at the posterolateral side of the joint. So we remove them, and this is him post-op. Um, I know Val is going to talk about the rehab much more than, uh, than, than, uh, than I am, but I just thought it was, this was a really funny video. It's, uh, it's, I, spe I sped it up a little bit for you, Val, so you didn't have to uh, suffer through this. I just want to show that the elbow rehab is not just, especially in athletes, it's not only elbow rehab. It's, uh, it's uh, core, it's uh, coordination, it's uh, proprioceptors, it's everything um, with the elbow rehab. This is only 12 days post-op, it sutures are out, and this range of motion is already better than it's been uh, for the past year.
obviously it's very mode. This is not a standard patient, uh, as you as you know, but it's uh, it's one that uh, documented his rehab very very nicely and uh, sent all those little videos to me. So um, that's why I was able to show you. I think we're getting to the end. He's getting better and better. You see the determination on his face. He's not hurting, and in four weeks post-op, he's playing tennis. Um, well, even at this point, he's better than me. But then at about eight weeks post-op, he's hitting the, the ball without any hesitation. He's, he's uh, back to his normal game again. Sometimes the brimin is not the, the best way to go. This patient was only 50 and um, we talked about uh, the, the, the possibilities. As you see, he had a radial head resection, and because of the radial head resection, his elbow became unstable or was unstable when they resected it, and his only humeral joint is completely gone. Um, because he's only 50, uh, we talked about the possibility of maybe just doing a deprivement to decrease some pain and hopefully increase his elbow function a little bit so we can, uh, we can avoid total elbow replacement. And uh, it worked for a while, but um, this might be a little bit too far to, uh, to still say. So total elbow replacement is replacement of the articulation, uh, the humerus and the ulna, and uh, that's one system that uses a radius as well by an artificial joint. Indications used to be rheumatoid arthritis, followed by post-traumatic arthritis, trauma, osteoarthritis, and the, the occasional tumor. However, uh, sorry, and the 10 year survival was pretty good. So rheumatoid arthritis, 92%. So uh, uh, these figures are mainly from Dr. Mori, who's one of the pioneers of uh, total health replacement. And 92% um, is obviously pretty good uh, at 10 years. However, because of the changing indications, because of the medication that uh, all but uh, eradicated uh, rheumatoid arthritis, at least, you know, completely um, degenerated uh, rheumatoid elbows, we don't, we don't see. We, we see them once every three, four years in, uh, in my practice. And um, I've got a pretty high volume practice. So um, trauma only 82%. So that's a bit worse. 20% will, will have already had a revision after 10 years. Complications, that's even worse. Complications in patients with trauma, post-traumatic arthritis, 52%, 34%, and osteoarthritis, 50%. Whereas in rheumatoids, the complication rate was only 23, obviously because of the uh, uh, decreased um, loading to the elbow that was necessary for these patients. So elbow arthroplasty has quite a bad reputation because of instability, fracture components, wear of the components, loosening of the components, like in this case, um, this was already a revision done uh, by, by another surgeon, and uh, I'll, I'll give it a good whack and it'll come out. And you can see how long the stem was already, you know, that was placed. Was, uh, here it comes. There you go. Huge stem. So that's a very difficult decision, uh, uh, revision with the bone loss, and we used uh, a tibia graft to do this, but um, despite the huge stem, it can still loosen. Periprosthetic fractures, wound problems, ulnar nerve uh, problems, very, very common. Triceps insufficiency up to 30%, uh, depending on the series that you read. But uh, like I said, elbow replacements have, have a very bad uh, a reputation. So why are there so many complications? Like Ali already said, the indications changed. And not only did the indications change, but even the elderly patients are more high demand. So people want to use their elbow and they want to still do sports and they want to still go uh, play golf, tennis, uh, go swimming, and uh, uh, work in their backyard. And uh, so it's very important to talk to those patients about what's allowed and what they can't do. Um, uh, some uh, studies from the UK showed that surgeons factors play a role as well. It's definitely not the cause of all problems, but most surgeons performing total elbow replacement do not have a lot of experience with this procedure. In the best survey a couple of years ago, uh, the number of total elbow replacement in 2014 only 1% did more than 15. So 99% did less than 15 and 95% did less than 10. So um, patient, uh, surgeons are not very, uh, uh, very well aware of how to do this procedure, I guess. Total hip arthroplasty, there's a clear association between surgeon volume and risk of complications after total hip arthroplasty. And they recommended to do at least 35 per year. So that would be one single surgeon probably in the UK doing doing this uh, amount of, uh, of uh, total level replacement. I, I just get there. 
surge in volume and experience are significantly prognostic, significant prognostic factors for deep infections after hemiartsplasty of the hip. And that's a very common procedure, obviously, after fractures. Still, if you're not that, that um, uh, if you don't have a high volume, the risk of infection will be bigger. This one's even more clear, significantly better scores. So this is not complications, these are outcome scores. If you do more than 100 total knee prosthesis a year, and even better if you do more than 200. So despite the fact that someone that does 100 per year is, is pretty experienced, someone that does 200 gets even better scores. So there's definitely um, an association between volume and uh, complications and um, outcome scores. This is a relatively recent study by Schrock from, from Germany, 20 patients, average 68 years old, uh, good follow-up, nine years uh, follow-up, um, flexion extension in the functional range, so between 25 to 130, that's, that's good. These patients are able to, uh, to have a, a nice um, a function in their activities of daily living. Uh, little pain, one and a half fast score, however, 50% complication, so a big complication rate in this uh, series as well. So total health replacement um, remains the last resort. Uh, try uh, all the other things first, if you can. Patient selection is crucial. So sometimes we do total health replacement for uh, primary fractures, but we talk to the patients about their expectations and what their needs are. And we recommend an experienced surgeon if we can. But if you have all these things, you can have very, very happy patients. Here's some examples, osteoarthritis, 82 year old, two weeks post-op. And uh, again, Val's gonna talk about this, but. This is what we see a couple of weeks post up, and uh, for privacy reasons, I had to cut off her, her, her big smile, but uh, she really enjoyed it. Well, you don't see it here, <laughs> but she's happy with this. 83 year old, uh, osteoarthritis, three weeks post up again. Um, a, you know, very good movement, but what these patients all have in common, they're, they're really happy about the de decreased pain, despite the fact that it's only a couple of weeks after surgery, they feel that the surgical pain is lost less painful and that's scraping pain from the, uh, from the arthritis. 80 year old male, very bad elbow. And these patients walk around with a lot of pain for a number of years because uh, the GP, uh, the physio, they will all say, oh, first of all, they might say total elbow replacement. I don't think that anyone does that because it's very uncommon. So uh, some uh, GPs and physios ne have never heard of it or, or have never seen a patient with it. And um, others will say, well, you know, don't do it because you'll, you'll, your elbow will be ruined because of that reputation that elbow replacement has. 63-year-old, a little more uncommon, but uh, clear uh, primary osteoarthritis. You see the, the uh, decreased gap between the ulna and the humerus and the radius and the, and the humerus, so there's really no cartilage left in this patient, uh, 45 to 100 degrees, so decreased motion. This is two weeks post-op, and this is motion at two weeks, so already you know, almost doubled this motion and again it's not painful. One year post-op still the same as, uh, as at two weeks. This is one of my favorite slides and all of those patients that I showed you three weeks post-op, two weeks post-op and if you now may be thinking you know okay that's nice to have an early uh, uh, result but we want to see results after a, you know a year uh, maybe this one after a year, three years, nine years they maintain their range of motion, they maintain their pain relief, unless they have a complication, obviously. So elbow arthritis is relatively rare. Uh, treatment is conservative for the, for the majority, great majority of patients. Surgery, if needed. Um, I prefer arthroscopy, unless there's an indication to it open, uh, and total elbow replacement is the last resort. Thank you. Thanks for that, Roger. Great talk, um, as always. Um, while Val is putting up her slides, I'm just going to ask um, a few, make a few comments and maybe ask a few questions. Um, there have been some questions from the audience, I think, for some of the questions that you have covered already with your um, slides. Um, elbow arthroplasty, right? So is, is the numbers in UK have fallen and British Elbow and Shoulder Society kind of um, uh, want to have super centers, right? So for example, in London, I think there are only going to be three super centers and someone like Bart's Health can actually do it, but only for post-trauma, right? So the, and there's a good reason for it. As you kind of said, the, we all of the surgeons can't keep on doing one every year or every other year, right? Um, because the risks of 
um, replacing elbows when you don't do enough, um, having complications is high. Um, so the one comment to make on that is that, you know, the having somebody like you, you around is a real asset because, you know, there, there is a need for, there is still enough elbows happening, uh, but because most people are not doing it, that somebody like you and your experience with it makes a huge difference uh, to patients and the outcomes. Uh, so that was my comment. The other thing was about um, uh, your thoughts about um, arthroscopy of the elbow, because mm -hmm. in a similar way, you know, shoulder arthroscopic treatment for arthritis has come a long way. Um, my personal experience is that I'm seeing younger and younger patients uh, come through um, who have arthritis. You know, what do you do with somebody who has, you know, arthritic changes at the age of 50? What, what happens when they're 40? You know, what happens when they're 30? Um, and in fact, if you look into it and from the shoulder point of view, what's quite interesting is a lot of times the arthritis may not be the pain generator. Right? There's often other stuff. There's usually a, maybe an ossified, maybe impinging, or it could be the biceps hurting them, or they could have developed secondary frozen shoulder. Um, so in my experience, I see a lot of patients that have been offered arthroplasty because the x-rays suggest arthritis, uh, but then you end up treating them for their pain generators. And now I have upwards of 60 patients that I've treated with a comprehensive arthroscopy management and, and sorted it out who still have arthritis, but have a very functional shoulder and don't need a shoulder replacement. So my feeling is that you, you feel that the elbow is similar as well. There are quite a few patients in your practice that um, you can avoid elbow replacement by doing an arthroscopic intervention despite them still having uh, cartilage defects. Is that correct? Yes, sure. Um, um, di different to the shoulder, in uh, elbow arthritis, you can you can actually get quite a lot of information from the uh, from the clinical exam. So if they have pain at the end range of motion when you're when you're flexing the elbow and it's that's painful, or pain at the end range at the at the extension and that's very painful and you and you click them a little bit and that that causes their pain and they know their pain, well th those do very very well with uh, elbow arthroscopy. If you get the grip and grind test again, I, I learned this from uh, from David Stanley. I mentioned him a few times. But if you ask the patient to grip your fingers and grind the radial capitella joint in different in different angles of uh, flexion extension, if that's painful, that doesn't react too well to uh, to uh, uh, elbow arthroscopy unless you do a radial lateral section, obviously. Um, so from the clinical exam, from the CT scan, I get a lot of information, and I'm I'm usually able to predict um, and tell the patient, listen, this is what you can expect from this surgery. Um, if that's okay with you and, and you feel that you've improved for, let's say, 60%, but you'll still have some additional pain or some residual pain when you're doing this and this and this, you get quite happy patients. Um, I had a patient and that patient changed my career. He was, um, and my outlook on this, he was over 80, well over 80, and he had, a, he had an orchard and um, his elbow to me, he had degenerative elbow. I told him, listen, you need a prosthesis, but you're not allowed to lift more than five kilos uh, and not allowed to lift more than one and a half kilo repetitively. And he said, no way, that's, that's impossible because you know, I might as well die if I, don't, if I can't tend to my orchard. And um, so we did an arthroscopy and uh, uh, unfortunately, I think he has uh, died now, but uh, for three or four years after the surgery, he came with, uh, with a bunch of apples for me because he was so happy to tell me, listen, I'm still moving. I can still work in my, in my orchard, I'm happy. And um, he stopped coming, so, but he was you know, 86 or 87. So uh, I, think he, I think he died happily without a prosthesis. Yeah, yeah, that's fantastic. In, in, the, in the shoulder world, um, as long as your shoulder is round shaped and hasn't flattened off, and you don't have obvious instability, i.e. in the posterior direction or the mm -hmm. superior direction because of the cuff. So if the mechanical stability is there, and if the shape is more round shape, even if you lose the cartilage, um, I find that um, um, an, an arthroscopic intervention can actually buy them a lot of time, you know? Um, mm -hmm. and, and, and just like your um, experience, if arthroplasty was definitive for the rest of your life and had relatively low complications, we will all do it, right? But the problem is there are complications 
um, and it is a metallic thing. It won't last forever. So anything that we can do to enhance the, preserve the joint as such for the younger population is, uh, you know, most welcome by our patients. So without further ado, the um, Star Wars is here in town. <laughs> Thanks, Val. You're up. Okay, so today we're going to have a look at Physio for shoulder and elbow osteoarthritis. It's a quick whistle stop tour, um, but what lessons can we work, learn from Star Wars? Um, in a dark place, we will find ourselves and a little more knowledge will maybe light our way. And that comes from Yoda, who you will see later on was one of the principal physiotherapists. Um, and hopefully by the end of today, we'll be able to shed a little bit of light about what physiotherapy can offer patients with shoulder and elbow arthritis. So what are the optimal conservative rehab uh, strategies? Well, there is a lack of evidence regarding optimal regimes for upper limb um, arthritis. So we have to extrapolate a lot from the lower limb uh, work, but the aims of physiotherapy are to improve the joint range, increase strength, improve endurance, decrease pain, and ultimately to improve a patient's function. So what are tips and tricks? Well, use the hand. Um, at the end of the day, I'm afraid the shoulder and elbow are really slaves to the hand. Their primary function is to place the hand anywhere in space it wishes to go. So if you actually use the hand, if you grip, they've shown this on a functional MRI scanners, if you grip your hand, the area corresponding to the shoulder and the elbow in the motor cortex lights up like Las Vegas rather than Sheffield on a wet Wednesday evening. So by using the hand, we can actually stimulate motor activity in the shoulder and the hand. So use the hand, use, it, use the upper limb functionally. For the elbow, in terms of improving range of motion, whether they're being treated conservatively or post-operatively, optimal positioning is paramount. And the overhead mobilization position as described by Hotchkiss is absolutely paramount to this. It decreases the activity in an overactive biceps and allows the patient to gain as much flexion and extension as they possibly can. We're gonna use the kinetic chain as well. Studies have shown that if you actually take a step forward with your lower limb, whilst actually moving your upper limb, you can increase EMG activation in the cuff and the scapular muscles in the order of 25 to 30%. So the, and that's because the brain remembers functional patterns of movement. It doesn't remember isolated muscle activations. So use the whole body to actually improve your rehabilitation strategies and outcomes. And remember, we'll talk about this later on, that the elbow is a little bit vacant in terms of proprioception. So we'll use things like sleeves, using skin compression to actually improve proprioceptive input from the upper limb. Strength training, if we're talking to patients about what they should actually do to improve strength, two to three times a week as a minimum, and usually they should be looking to fatigue. So they look at a particular exercise, we're looking at weights in that exercise where they fatigue after about eight to 12 reps and three sets to fatigue with a two to three minute gap in between each set of exercise. But we would recommend no more than five times a week and also don't increase any load by any more than 10% a week because the body in terms of tendons, joints, etc., can't cope with an increase of load of more than 10%. And the exercise parameters are also really important. When patients say, should I exercise into pain or not? There is some evidence to show that as long as it's low level pain in terms of no more than two to three out of 10 on a visual analog scale, and it doesn't last for any more than 30 minutes after they've stopped activity, that can be beneficial. So again, don't overload though. Don't start lifting really heavy weights. If you're lifting weights where you can only sort of perform four to six reps before you get fatigue, then that's a heavy strength resistance exercise. And that really shouldn't be form, performed any more than a couple of times a week because you actually go into collagen deficit for 48 hours after that type of exercise. And then you start to slowly build up your collagen reserves again. And there is some evidence to show that aerobic type exercise decreases pain in patients with osteoarthritis. So get them on a bike, get them out walking, get them swimming, whatever you can to just increase their activity levels. So uh, Roger talked about this before. Now on the blue side, as a physiotherapy, we can help change all those modifiable factors by sending a patient to physio. We can help them by educating them, reducing depression, anxiety, and coping mechanisms. On the red side, can't change rage. Genetics, it's really a question of you need to choose your parents more carefully. But there are systemic factors, including obesity, that we can actually work with. Because we know that 
everybody thinks, oh, well, shoulder and elbow, do not weight bearing joints anyway. So why would obesity, just because you've got a heavier arm, actually be a problem? Well, it's not just about the weight of the upper limb. Visceral fat secretes pro-inflammatory cytokines that actually causes inflammatory changes in the musculoskeletal system in terms of the joints and the tendons. So by actually reducing weight, reducing the level of visceral fat, it can have a, a, an effect on actually reducing inflammatory changes within the musculoskeletal tissues. And obviously we talked about teaching them about what's a progressive load that the body can tolerate, which we said is no more than 10% increase in load a week. So many of the truths that we cling to depend on our point of view, meaning that we actually hold on to maybe outdated practices because it's something we've always done rather than regularly challenging our beliefs. So the original anatomical shoulder rehab guide was devised in Hughes and Neer in 1975. And look, they had active movements after four to six weeks, stretching and resisted work three months. And a lot of places when they've had a look more recently at rehab guidelines that are currently in practice in the UK are still being used. They haven't changed, they haven't evolved. Chris Littlewood produced this paper this year that showed most centres on average immobilise a patient after a, a shoulder arthroplasty for four weeks, only bring in active exercise after four weeks, resisted exercise at six weeks, driving at six weeks, general work at 12 weeks. And, but what has happened is this implant design has evolved, surgical techniques have evolved, the rehab is still treading water. We've not moved on. And I think this is where we really need to change to achieve optimal outcomes for our patients. So the rehab guidelines, I would say, don't accept the status quo. If you go and work in a new department and they've got historical sort of total shoulder and total elbow rehab guidelines, challenge them, have a look at them. Are they currently up to date in terms of what is best practice? And development of any post-op guidelines should be a collaborative process by surgeons and therapists together. We have regular meetings, we have pre, sort of pre-op planning meetings and following that pre-COVID we used to have fish and chip Fridays where we used to go and have lunch together with the therapist and the surgeon so we could talk about on how we were going to develop our practice for the best interests of the patients and all our rehab guidelines are actually uh, yearly reviewed so to make sure that we're actually observing sort of what is current best practice. And I think it's really important that lots of physios go and observe surgical practice. You'll often have physios sitting in with surgeons on a regular basis. I've, I've spent hours in with, with different surgeons, but I could probably count on all my fingers and all my toes the amount of surgeons that have spent a whole morning in clinic with me. Know what your physiotherapist does, and then you'll be less frightened of what they're going to do to your patients when you send them for their post-op rehab. So we know as physiotherapists, it's a balancing act. When you've had surgery, there's a, we've got to allow adequate bone, soft tissue healing, but we've got to prevent post-op muscle, post-op stiffness and muscle atrophy. And rehabilitation obviously does depend on surgical approaches, tissue quality and patient's comorbidities. So that surgical, surgeon therapist communication that we've developed really, really well in the unit in Sheffield is absolutely vital. You shouldn't have to shout at your colleagues like this. And the safe zone in the op notes is absolutely vital. If you feel that sort of certain tissues need to be protected, write down the range of movement that you want your patient to move through. Or in the case of the elbow replacements, write down what your range of movement at the end of the procedure was. And that helps me understand about what I'm aiming to achieve in my post-op rehab. And I think patients are different in terms of how they are biologically. One person at 65 may be biologically 55 and another one may be 75. So our old traditional guidelines used to have fixed timescales, but people heal at different rates depending on comorbidities, etc. And I think they should be therefore based on functional milestones and therefore should be individualized to each patient. And also we should manage patient expectations well as, as physi physiotherapists. So look, Yoda was always a, a physiotherapist at heart because he said always in motion is the future. Well, the future is keeping somebody moving. But traditionally, this hasn't happened. Immobilization surgeon thought held many benefits for a patient after maybe a shoulder and an elbow replacement. And traditionally, patients have been sent home in slings. The slings are only removed for washing, dressing, elbow or shoulder exercises. And they felt that with the shoulders, particularly keeping somebody in a sling, protected deltoid, subscap, and in the case of hemiarthroplasties, tuberosity repairs, 
It allows healing to occur and reduces the incidence of post-op complications. But does it? Well, immobilization has a real downside. We've got local changes in a decrease in muscle size within hours, which is in rapid in the first four weeks after immobilization. That's in compounded in inflammatory states. Well, what are you post-surgically but in an inflammatory state? It gets worse on a daily basis and muscle fatigue increases rapidly already. And we've got to remember if a patient's having surgery for osteoarthritis, they're probably already deconditioned anyway. So they've got decreased muscle power anyway, decreased muscle strength. So we're adding insult literally to injury. But we don't just get local changes in the hardware of the upper limb. We also get remote changes when we immobilize somebody. We decrease the cortical representation in both size and excitability daily in areas corresponding to the shoulder and the elbow. And when you take the patient out of their sling, that hasn't returned two weeks post sling use. So the brain isn't really firing on all cylinders when it has to switch on the shoulder and elbow musculature. Now we know your area of cortical representation actually shrinks in the elderly. So we've got a decreased size in cortical representation. We're immobilizing them, again, adding insult to injury in the motor cortex, as well as in the local musculature. And also by sticking somebody in a sling, immobilizing them, we're gonna have an increased risk of falls. And I think somebody falling after having a shoulder or an elbow replacement is much more harmful than actually getting somebody to use their arm use for low demand active exercises, say making sort of table slides, et cetera. You're far more likely to have a serious consequence from a fall than you are from having um, to undertake a general physio exercises. So look at this. Wearing a sling causes balance decompensation, almost one third of healthy volunteers. It's greater when worn in the non-dominant hand with double the number of falls. And so we will actually sort of make sure that our patients get rid of a sling as soon as possible. And I'll also do lots of lower limb strengthening. If I'm seeing the patients preoperatively, we'll get them doing lots of quads exercises so they're not having to use their upper limbs to help them get out of chairs, etc. So the force is strong with this one. And that's what you, you surgeons sometimes are a little bit worried about, that the exercises we give to your patients are too strong and we're gonna actually undo all your good work in theater. We're gonna rip the deltoid off. We're gonna actually cause subscap to tear. We're gonna do all sorts of things to the elbow prosthesis. But to go back to the shoulder replacements, if you look at this work here, if you look at the um, say subscap and deltoid here, the amount of EMG activation in subscap and deltoid, when you're taking your shirt on and off, or you're actually taking your sling on and off, is much higher than when you do pendulum exercises or when you do activities such as ball rolling or actually active assisted motion in lying for the deltoid. So this is just showing a little bit more about that. So you can see taking your shirt on and off is actually much higher activity in your deltoid, et cetera, in subscap than actually doing active assisted exercises. So if you let your patients take the shirts on and off in the post-op period, which I hope you do, because I wouldn't like to see them in a sling for four weeks with no shirt on or, or actually taking the sling on and off, then you should allow them to do active movement straight away. And I think to be perfectly honest, the elbow surgeons are better at this they, they actually promote early active movement. It's the shoulder surgeons that are a little bit more cautious. So my mantra is move it, move it in a safe zone with a safe exercise that's actually working subscap and, and deltoid at low percentages of a maximal voluntary contraction. So for the reverses, the reverses are often reliant on deltoid anyway for the stability. So why stick them in a sling and let deltoid switch off completely? So what I do is I, I get my patient in this position, passively move them up to 90 degrees. If they can hold their arm in that position, that tells me deltoid's firing enough for them to then go without a sling in the house. So once they can do this base test here, they're good to go without a sling when they're in the home environment. And as long as you keep them below that 100 degrees, it's safe. They've looked at active mobilization in the Reading unit and found that early active mobilizations cause no more complications than delayed mobilizations. And the other, other research echoes that as well. So we sling is only worn for comfort in the home for the first few days, maybe, but we always tell them to wear it outside in busy areas just to make sure people don't bump into them, etc. 
use the hand as we've said, try and tap into the motor cortex by getting the areas of the brain corresponding to the elbow and shoulder switching on using the hand and use functional patterns of movement make sure it's milestone driven and small loads from four to six weeks. Patients are going to be lifting cups of tea and doing all sorts of stuff when they're at home anyway, as they feel better. And then return to full function. And remember, full function is very much patient dependent. As, as Roger said, we have a changing sort of climate now where people who are over 70 still want to play tennis, they want to go to the gym, they want to ski, etc. So we have to be able to return patients to their functional goals. And what's the evidence for this early mobilisation? Well, there isn't a huge amount of evidence, but the evidence does show that it hasn't any sort of adverse effects. And what it does allow people to do is actually return to functional levels faster. The outcomes are the same at 12 months, but they get there faster. So keep people moving. For special consideration for the elbows, start active and active assisted elbow range immediately. Sling for comfort. We, we sometimes put them longer if they're unlinked with an absent radial head and reinforce those functional limitations because patients do like to forget what they can and can't do after an elbow arthroplasty. But we also use the principle of cross activation as well. So this is where you do strength training in the contralateral limb, they're on operated upper limb. And what happens is that maintains cortical excitability, muscle cross-sectional area and strength in the operated upper limb. So all our patients will get strength work, not just for the operated upper limb, but also for the unaffected one as well. And factors to remember about the elbow is the elbow is a bit like Donald here, a bit vacant, a bit proprioceptively vacant, um, because there are limited capsular mechanoreceptors and proprioceptors, and there's a tendency for the elbow to drift into flexion with limited higher center processing. So most of the elbow, get, well, the elbow gets most of its proprioceptive input from the cutaneous receptors and your Golgi tendon organs. And we know following total elbow replacement, proprioception is reduced throughout range. So what can we do as therapists to help that? Well, use things like touch, pressure, compression. So they may wear a, a sleeve, they may wear a tuber grip. Get touch or get put your hands on the patient as they're mobilizing their elbow in that overhead position. Use visual imagery, use functional multi-joint sequences, use the hand as we said, Bilateral movement, helping mirror and, and sort of getting cross activation patterns going in the motor cortex, kinetic chain recruitment, and basically the patient following a total elbow replacement should be functional by eight to 12 weeks, if not earlier, following surgery. And one of the questions I always get asked is, when can I drive? Well, this was interesting at a paper, um, changes in driving performance following your shoulder arthroplasty. At the earliest, the patients don't return to their pre-op driving levels until six weeks. But that's only if they're regular drivers and they were quite confident. If there's somebody that only takes the car out for a spin once on a Sunday at 20 miles an hour, then it may take them up to 12 weeks if, to actually regain their previous driving sort of status and function. What about return to work and sport? It's usually two to three months post-op, six weeks if they're light to demand jobs. There is a, after arthroplasty, there is a lower return for patients with manual jobs and return to sport from usually three months on. Finally, what are the appropriate functional limitations? Well, there aren't any set parameters in terms of is it research-based, but most surgeons describe low to moderate levels of dexterous activity, low load gardening, Swimming, crown bream bowling, golf. There is some dispute about that. I know at some of the, the units, especially with total elbow arthroplasty, they don't like them playing golf at, at some of the, the units and modify high impact activities such as skiing and tennis after shoulder or elbow arthroplasty and no jarring activities such as chopping wood. But also don't forget functional limitations may also think about systemic factors. Um, in Sheffield, we had a look at patients whose BMI was over 30 compared with under 30 and patients with a BMI over 30, their elbow joint um, replacement or, or sort of was twice more likely to, to loosen at 5, 10 and 15 year follow up. So we need to literally talk about the elephant in the room. And do patients comply with what we tell them when they've actually been told, or given advice about what you can and can't do post-operatively? Well, this is a, a paper um, from uh, Jonathan Barlow that said uh, most patients sort of 80% um, recall pre-op advice where they were told they weren't supposed to perform high demand activities, only moderate demand. 
but 40% still actually undertook high demand activities. And patients who were least likely to comply with the elbow arthroplasties were male post-trauma patients. So the take home messages from today are communication is vital between the surgeon and the therapist. Early mobilization is safe as long as precautions are taken. Keep them in the safe zone. Discuss with your surgeon what you can and can't do. Individual, individualized milestones. Let's progress patients as they're able to go. Start loading them immediately with early active mobilization. Remove the sling as soon as possible to avoid falls and rehab patients back to their individual levels of function. Give your physiotherapist free reign a bit more and then they'll tell you, I won't fail you. I'm not afraid. And thank you for your attention. Well, that was fantastic as always. Uh, I always learn a lot about rehab. Should attend more clinics with you, I think. <laughs> You're welcome anytime. Yeah, of course. A bit far though, Sheffield, especially during lockdown. <laughs> um, so that was fantastic. I mean, look, the uh, most, most um, shoulder and elbow surgeons are now moving rapidly towards less time in sling. You know, the mantra of stiffness is the enemy. The elbow, like you said, the elbow doesn't like being um, held in one place, right? Even in the fracture world, you know, either it's a stable injury and you get it going or it's unstable. So you fix it and get it going. Right. Um, and we're getting like that with the shoulder as well. So, you know, not just the arthroplasty, but obviously the instability work and the cuff work, we're mobilizing them pretty early. Um, and I think patients are, um, uh, are better off for it. Right. Um, I, I, Anecdotally, many years ago, there were a bunch of patients um, that um, would not listen to their surgeon and just get on with life and start doing stuff. And, you know, I think they did a lot better than those patients that were really timid to move, right, generally speaking. So it has to say something about, you know, you fix it well and you get it going soon. Uh, these patients do better. Um, are there any other questions from uh, for either of us from the from the panelists? You're on mute, Jag. Uh, Roger, you know, uh, hemiarthroplasty in shoulder doesn't have a good outcome, but we are seeing lots of hemiarthroplasties post trauma in elbows. Uh, how are they doing in the long term? The long term, we don't know. Um, we uh, we know that they uh, they do well in very limited uh, indications. So younger patients that um, really you don't want to do a total elbow replacement in because they will uh, they will not do well. You know, less than forty five years old, the uh, expectation the life expectation of a total elbow replacement is less than five years. So um, so if you can avoid a total elbow replacement, that's uh, preferred. Um, however, if you can do an osteosynthesis, that's better than a hemi. So, um, so we try to do, uh, we try to fix those patients if we can, and uh, uh, we will use screws and uh, headless screws and pins and whatever we need to get uh, to get the articulation fixed. However, if we really can't fix it, then there may be an indication for a hemi And um, so, you know, maybe to avoid your answer, your, your question a little bit, but. Um, if I can avoid hemiarthroplasty, I will, uh, because I feel that um, they, it's, it's not the answer. It's really, really the last resort. And unfortunately, patients don't see it that way because they do quite well in the beginning. They, have, they don't have a lot of pain. And um, um, I have a patient who, uh, who was throwing around medicine balls after within six weeks, and uh, he was doing very well, and that scares me. You know, So he's, he's still okay two, three years out, but uh, it scares me a little bit. And, um, Thank you. We'll whereas, you, whereas you fix it and you preserve the joint yeah. and you know that if they're going to be okay after three months, they're going to be probably okay for decades to come after that, right? Exactly. Uh, it's a lot harder to fix things than to replace them, right? And sometimes, you know, um, it's an easier option just to do a quick replacement. Uh, but fixing a, a smashed up distal humerus, um, you know, takes a lot more skill than to put a big piece of metal in. Yeah, not only skill, but it, it, it's more painful for the patient as well. You know, patients are quite happy after a hemiarthroplasty. They, uh, right. yeah. they really happen very, very fast. And uh, instability in the right indication is not a problem um, in, uh, in those patients. Whereas, you know, like Vel said, if you have a, 
smash this little humerus and you feel that that your fixation is not um, not that great you'll probably tell the patient not to go to physio or you tell the physio not to move too much maybe just decrease the swelling a little bit if you can and uh, you know um, so you'd be very you'd be quite scared whereas in a, in a hemi they they move straight away they have no well, very limited problems but long term we don't know there is a rise in, in the number of hemiarthroplasties in yeah. the UK, so yeah, time will tell. Uh, the biggest experience is from, from Australia, from um, um, Jeff Hughes, mm. and he's gone away from it a little bit after, uh, you know, obviously trying to expand the envelope a little bit and trying to expand the indications, but he's gone away from it um, because of the problems that he saw relatively early afterwards, let's say three, four, five years later. Gotcha. Thank you. Like most things in the world, you know, there's just something new comes in and they do too much of it and then they uh, walk away a little bit. Uh, fantastic. Well, guys, that was, a, you know, a great webinar, really well attended, as always, for the upper limb. I think we beat the lower limb knee guys every single time. So thank you for all the participants that joined us tonight. Um, I'd like to thank uh, all of you uh, to attending, especially the panelists. Rags, thanks for arranging. Val, Jag. And Roger, thank you again. Um, and hopefully we'll do one more soon in the near future. Thank you. Thank Have you. a good night, everybody. Thanks, guys. Well, well thank you, Val. Well. Bye. Yeah. Bye.